Okay, welcome back everyone. Hope you enjoyed the coffee break and a chance to network and if I could just get your attention, we'll, we'll try and start. Thank you. So I hope you've managed to enjoy the refreshment break, catch up on the gossip from down the road in London, which there is plenty and I suspect will be plenty for some time. So it'll be at least plenty to talk about, even if we solve all the technology challenges in healthcare, which that could take a while. So um, I don't think we'll be idle with our minds. Um, but thanks for coming back. I think I thought this morning set the scene really well from my perspective in terms of there are many challenges, there are many solutions. We just need to really get to grips with how we integrate across a wide spectrum of things to bring the best solutions forward. So going on from that, you get a chance, the other sessions to maybe dig a bit deeper into some of those different aspects. And I'm delighted to introduce Julia Gwilt, Napoli Yard Lees, who will take us through the, the next panel session, looking very much at where we go with the AI data and then bringing innovative drugs to market and what everyone's doing. So I shall hand over to Julia. Thank you, Tony. You know, hopefully everyone um, enjoyed the first session this morning and, and it obviously was very general talking about all sorts of innovation and maybe we can drill down into some detail in this session. I'm delighted to be joined by um, Rabia, James and, and Pascal who are going to give their thoughts around um, AI discovered drugs and, and, and their in a, the innovation in a, in a more specific field and hopefully some, some war stories and some examples to just kind of crystallise some of the more general thoughts that we were talking about this morning. So I, I appreciate we're, we're a little bit late starting and there is another panel session before lunch so maybe we'll just we'll crack straight on and I'll get started with um, James just to introduce um, himself and, uh, and his company and explain um, what they're doing in this space. So thank you. Certainly, no problem. So yeah, before I introduce myself and my role at Farmenable, I'm going to talk a little bit about the company and how we use kind of AI. So Farmenable is a virtual first uh, early stage drug discovery company um, looking to integrate uh, the latest in AI and human expertise to generate the next generation of small molecules in the oncology space. So all the founders met here or over there in Cambridge um, and the company started in 2016 as a spin out of Cambridge University. So all the members of Farm and Able were sharing the same mission and that is to bring new therapies to patients that have got either improved efficacy or an improved safety profile. And as a company we're very chemistry centric so we're focusing on identifying the best chemistry for this. And the way we want to do that is to find molecules that are more complex or three dimensional. We believe that this you know, taking forward to the clinic will have better patient outcomes. Um, what's unique about Farm and Able is that we have uh, a unique understanding of the chemistry and how we relate that to biological activity. So we're not constrained by existing knowledge and we don't screen virtual libraries to find a hit matter. What we've got is a computational or a mathematical definition of the entirety of drug-like chemical space, which is an estimated 10 to the 62 molecules, of which only a small fraction has been tapped into so far. Um, so with this mathematical um, definition, we're able to identify uh, for a specific disease target, the, the most optimal region of chemical space to populate dynamically with novel small molecules and then to mine them to identify the best molecules to make. And obviously, as being you know, a multi-dimensional problem, uh, chemical space, we've used obviously AI and deep learning techniques to be able to generate that. As a drug discovery company, we obviously have other um, models that we can predict adding properties and physicochemical parameters of our uh, compounds. But we also have a retrosynthesis tool so our medicinal chemists can uh, use a retrosynthesis um, yeah. planner that we have <coughs> in-house in order to enable to identify the most optimal route uh, to kind of make our molecules. So I'm James Ale, I'm the Director of Drug Discovery at Farm Label and my responsibility is overseeing our internal pipeline of uh, small molecule assets uh, as well as supporting the wider scientific team with our um, co-discovery partnerships and other collaborations. So as a medicinal chemist by background, uh, I've got nearly 20 years in the industry and I've seen the transition from traditional computational or computer-aided drug design through big data to the kind of AI approach. And for me personally, when you kind of distill it all down, it's all about using computation and the data that we have to generate new hypotheses to test in the lab. I think that was mentioned at the previous panel in order for us to make better decisions. And that's the kind of key to you know, unlocking or improving patient lives is by making the best decisions on which molecules to take forward uh, into the clinic. Obviously with modern techniques and instrumentation that we have, we can generate huge vast quantities of data. Obviously we need that data to talk together with machine learning in order to uh, access and enable it. But you know, for me, I'm kind of excited for the future. We've got some good successes. The first AI discovered drugs you know, reaching the clinic. Um, there's still a lot to do though. 
and I'm sure we'll touch on some of those points uh, in this discussion. So. Yeah, thank, thank you, James. I'm just going to speak again just to check that my microphone is working a bit better. And also just to clarify, um, I know we're talking about AI discovered, but we agreed amongst the panel uh, that AI we would interpret in its very broadest sense, so any sort of computer-aided design. And I appreciate, and it's one of the things that was touched on this morning, I, I, I'm assuming that the audience is more on the, the biotech chemical end rather than the AI. I've done a very similar panel for Cambridge Wireless where we got we're very focused on the very exact definition of AI and machine learning. I'm expecting that won't be the topic today, but obviously that's something we can maybe take at the, the lunch break if people are really interested in that. But um, just, just to make that clear before I hand over to um, Pascal, because I think that's a, a valid point for what um, Pascal's going to explain about how Charles Rivers contributed in this space. Mm, absolutely. So before I start talking about my role and what I do within Charles River uh, for those who don't know, Charles River is a very big CRO, uh, an American CRO, and we work across the whole spectrum of early uh, drug discovery, so from um, hit ID to a, a preclinical stage. So it's a very wide range of things that we do. But myself, I work for the small molecule division within Charles River that's mainly based in the UK. We've got a few sites here in Cambridge, in Harlow, and elsewhere. So uh, within the small, uh, uh, molecule division. Uh, I'm a computational uh, chemist, but I'm, like you, I'm a medicinal chemist by training. So I've got this kind of understanding of both uh, early, the early discovery process from medicinal chemistry point of view and also the computational aspects. And within my role, uh, I also work with a strategic partner, which is called uh, Valence Discovery. And, and that's an interesting part actually because in the definition of AI, we can talk about predictive models that we develop within Charles River, uh, certainly, but when it goes towards the more like complex deep learning aspect of AI, then we had to partner up with uh, Valence Discovery. So in my role, I'm a scientific lead on that partnership between Valence Discovery and Charles River. And being a CRO, we work with a very broad range of uh, partners, so from big pharma to um, uh, academic groups. So that's again a very broad umbrella of partners. And in my role, I try to bridge medicinal chemistry, computational chemistry, and AI, and trying to bring AI to help um, partners' programs, really. Thank you. Rabia, I'll hand over to you to introduce yourself and your, and your company. Thank you. Um, so, first of all, I'm not a chemist, so we can start there. Um, this is quite loud, also. I don't know if I can turn it down. Yeah. That's it. Um, so, uh, my background is, is biology, and I've come from a bit of a strange career journey where I've uh, worked at the intersection of machine learning and biology at companies like Benevolent AI, which I'm sure many of you know, and Sensine Health, building computational teams that take a clinical perspective to how do we understand patient data. But currently, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Ladder Therapeutics, where we're looking at building a map of the druggable transcriptome. And so the vision for the company was really around um, data generation and then using computational tools to analyze this information. Um, and most of what I'm interested in is how do we define where AI is going to be useful and where actually we could just use really basic methods. Because in biotech, it's, it's great to have AI, but I've seen a lot of people apply it where perhaps it's unnecessary. If, if your hit rate from a high throughput screen is 0.1% and doing very simple chem informatics can take you to 50%, do we really need a 10-person machine learning team to take it to 51%? I'm not sure. Um, but where I believe machine learning is going to really have step function improvements in what we can do today was touched upon is the ability to integrate heterogeneous data sets because we can create representations computationally that the human brain can't understand. So at Ladder, what we do is we generate a tremendous amount of our own data sets around RNA structure and small molecules, build computational pipelines to analyze that, predictive models to understand which chemical space, again, being very large, 10 to the 60, binds uh, different RNA structures, but then also how we can integrate that information with things like high content imaging. So there's really great companies like Recursion that have paved the way for that. Um, but really applying a lot of these tools into um, RNA as a target as opposed to a modality. Um, and the area that I love um, working at is actually how do you build teams that speak the two languages which, which you mentioned, because it's, it's been quite a journey watching it at Benevolent and then at Sunshine. 
Yeah, and I've, I'll just briefly introduce myself. I know you're really here to hear what they have to say, but so I, I'm actually on the software side. So we've got a good good range. Um, but um, I'm a patent attorney working, and I do do some bioinformatics work, and it's been very interesting um, over the last few years learning a new language. The bio, I'm sure the biotech people make up words, um, um, <laughs> but then they probably think the same about me. So it is one of the things that we'll touch on um, is how to get the. To, to avoid that lost in translation piece. But before we, we go down uh, the sort of culture piece, which was something that was mentioned this morning, maybe we just talk a little bit more about partnerships and, and the advantages that can be gained from that. And, and Pascal, you talked about um, that you, you obviously collaborate. Mm -hmm. um, so what advantages do you think that, that brings? Um, and it, are there any disadvantages when you start collaborating that you mm -hmm. have to deal with? Well, uh, as I said, for the uh, deep learning expertise that we didn't have in-house, uh, partnering with someone in that field with Im immediate expertise and very deep expertise available and exclusively as well if you, if you work within that model. So that's the main advantage. I would say that from my experience that working in this way with like us, um, our clients and then uh, Valence Discovery, it's the, the time timelines are a bit maybe slower than if we had AI yeah, expertise in house because you need to set up contracts, you need to set up um, confidential channels to exchange data and, and so on. So we, we're getting more agile and more able to do that quickly, but still, because that's a, also a very recent partnership, uh, we're kind of learning on the job as well. So I would say that the main disadvantage I could see is that the speed at which we can operate. Mm -hmm. But once everything is sorted in terms of contractual obligations and then confidentiality, actually uh, very quick, actually my role is to kind of facilitate this dialogue between our partners, uh, clients and partner, uh, AI partner. And, and interesting that you touched on the, the, the data. Data was mentioned as, as an issue this morning, but maybe Rabia, you want to follow up. I mean, it sounds like Pascal's reaching out to other partners to have access to that data, but you managed, mentioned you're generating a lot of data. Is that to, to overcome this partnership collaboration issue, or is it a, a totally different reason that you've gone down that route? Um, so, so we've gone down that route because the data sets for small molecule targeting RNA is, um, I think when I last looked, there's like 1,500 data points in the public domain, so, so there's not much to machine learn on. Um, but I actually think computational methods and data allow for new partnership models. So um, what I'm very interested in is how would we um, take our pipelines and have access to, let's say, the chemical libraries that pharma is sitting on, right? So classically, pharma would not open up their chemical libraries um, to say, please go explore them computationally. Um, but with companies like yours, perhaps, or ours, where like we have tools that will allow <coughs> us to learn about their chemical space and give that information back to them. I'm, I'm wondering if new partnership models for BD arms and pharma are evolving and emerging. And I think that's going to be something that computational companies are going to push further. James, did you want to add anything around the partnership models or the collaboration in general? Yeah, I mean, as a small company, partnerships are really critical and crucial for us as we kind of grow. So you can have the best technology in the world, but if you don't actually get real world validation, kind of what's the point? You know, it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> So we were really lucky, I guess, at the start of the pandemic that we got our seed funding, uh, so 1.8 million, which was really good, and that's taken us, you know, a really, you know, really long way. And from that, we built collaborations. So we've got Societe Tara, as we've recently announced with Denali, so in the CMS space. So for us, it's then applying our platform. You know, we think it's really great what we can do. We've got internal programs, but what we need to be able to go with to investors is then say, look, it really does work. You know, you can do as much validation internally as you want. But if you don't actually get wet data to say, look, and here's a result of what we've got, we've got a novel chemistry that we've identified using our platform, then you know you don't go anywhere. So that's where we're at. So we, you know, we've got that validation. We're going mm. out. You know, we're looking for our you know, first funding round. It's, you know, things are going well. Obviously, it's a challenging area. As we heard at the top of the, the meeting, you know, getting the, the first round in is, is difficult in this recession and you know with the, with the current climate. But I think the companies that do well in this period will be the ones that can kind of grow and really flourish and come out of the other side. So. For us, it's yeah, it's a kind of lifeblood. It's really important. So we've got. I see. I'm joined by Yelena today. She's our CBO, so she's one of the co-founders. You know, she's really driving that kind of side of the business because we know it's so critical and, and important for us. So, yeah. 
Yeah. So, the, so clearly, clearly the collaboration is key both with externally, but also internally. You're bringing together groups of different kinds of technicians, possibly. And we talked about the lost in translation piece. So, I'm just going to focus on that for a little while, and then maybe open the, the conversation up to, to invite members of the audience. So, uh, Pascal, if I come back to you, you mm -hmm. talked about you, you have some expertise in house. You're bringing some other mm -hmm. expertise from outhouse. Is that is you, have you needed to adapt in terms of getting to get the best out of the teams in terms of understanding one another from a technical point of view? Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that uh, that bringing creative sciences to uh, like drug discovery, but from the lab perspective, has been a challenge because people traditionally, like maybe by training or culturally, they're not used to to use predictive models or to kind of share data widely and then trust an algorithm or even worse like with deep learning which can be a black box as well so that, that that's something that we need to work on it's actually kind of educating the wider community of biologists and chemists like wet chemists as well to to work with uh machine learning and, and ai so that's uh, an active challenge to to sort out at the moment. Mm -hmm. And, and Rabia, you mentioned you, you've got a biotech background, but you've, you've kind of got more up to speed with the, the AI side of it, but maybe not to the same level as, the, as I say, when we, when we had the panelists on the Cambridge Wireless who were debating the nitty gritty of what reinforcement learning was. But do, is there something you'd like to say around the, 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 the culture piece, the education piece as well? I think there's a story from Benevolent AI when I first joined the company and I was talking to Potty who was in the ML team and he kept talking about Ensemble. Um, and to me, Ensemble is a website you go to for where genomic alignments sit. And that's the only definition of Ensemble I knew at the time. And he kept referring it to it in a sentence that just like comprehension wise, it didn't make sense. And I was like, what are you on about? And he was talking about an ensemble of models, just like computationally combining different models. And I was like, oh, we have like a fundamental language gap. So at Sensine, when I built my team, um, one of the first things we did is we started writing out a dictionary. Like when I say this, this is what I mean. <laughs> it's the strangest thing, but it actually made a difference because now you, like even the word could mean two different things, which is not, we're not trained that way in our education right now because our education is siloed, right? So until our education system doesn't transform to become multidisciplinary at the, um, like at, at the professional level, we're gonna have to give that training. And even at Ladder now, we spend a lot of time um, in meetings providing context and then the solution. So everyone is informed, so you can you can have an informed discussion. But it's a fascinating experience to build those teams. It's so much fun. Yeah, no, and I, I'd say from my perspective as a, as a software person, you know, for me, it's data in and data out. And so it's almost irrelevant from a biological or chemical process what's actually going on. And, and the example I've, I've given before is designing proteins. Well, we can make them aggregate. That's as, as an output, which is obviously not something that would necessarily, but for me, from a data science, it makes perfect sense. Why would not design to aggregate or disaggregate? It, it's always just words to me. And, and so, so, so keeping that, that's on the straight and narrow. And certainly, James, you, you touched on this in, as well in um, yeah. when we were meeting to prepare for the panel, so. Yeah, actually, I can resonate exactly what Rabi was saying. So I spent a small um, stint at Benevolent AI as well. And I think probably the same issues in terms of people learning different languages. And I've also instigated a dictionary of kind of acronyms within the company and it's brilliant you know the same acronym api for me is active pharmaceutical ingredient but you know api for you know some of the machine learning completely different so it's like you know it's like miscommunication is brilliant so yeah getting that sorted at the start kind of if it makes you feel any out. better i can say from a, a purely technical point of view some the words that google use aren't the same as the words that samsung uses because we interviewed someone uh, for a new role at ours, and, and he, uh, do you understand this term? No, and he was brave enough in an interview to say, "No, sorry, I don't recognise that term." So my colleague explained what the term was. Oh, I know that as such and such, and so and he was coming at it from a purely technical angle. So please uh, don't don't, no, don't worry. Exactly. You know, I think, but agreeing terms and how everyone is going to work is yeah. it seems like a very sensible but way there's, forward. There's definitely kind of barriers to picking things up. So I spent you know, nearly nine years at Novartis, and even within chemistry, it's hard to get people to do new, different things. So I was leading a team that was um, designed to look at new synthetic methodologies to try and access, you know, more complexity, uh, three-dimensionality in scaffolds. And 
you know, we'd go away and do a piece of work, we'd get some really great hit molecules and trying to get the project team to pick those molecules up because it wasn't invented there. It was a real challenge. And the way we kind of overcame it was to say, right, well, let's do sabbaticals. Let's people bring people into our group. So we were a small team. We'd kind of train them in the ways of thinking outside of the kind of, you know, synthesis box, and then they'd go back in the medchem team. So that worked really well. I think it's a similar thing now where you've got different interfaces between data science, biology, chemistry, and machine learning. It's, it's even further apart, you know, even with, in a subject, it's challenging, but when you've got multiple, it's even more so. So I think then it comes a little bit down to education and training people to understand what people are doing. And, you know, yeah, for me, it kind of goes to university level, even to kind of get that kind of cross fertilization of, you know, what does it mean to do an experiment in a way that is AI proofed? So that you're thinking that, and I think chemistry is easier. Biology is very challenging in terms of understanding. So, you know, hats off in terms of what you're doing. But you need to generate the data. I think there to kind of really reinforce what you're doing. And, yeah. So I'm conscious that there's a lot of the expertise in this room, and, and you just mentioned cross fertilisation. So let's fer cross fertilise between the panel and the audience. So is there anyone that wants to make a comment or ask a question or maybe follow up on something from this morning? Well, we've got two hands down the front. I don't know where the microphone is. Here it comes. Would, would you, you were slightly quicker. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Hello, this is um, So it's a question maybe specific to um, uh, to James. Really interesting discussion so far, thank you. Um, you you mentioned that you've formulated a kind of mathematical model of, um, or mathematical space that contains all possible drug candidates. Um, and I was curious if, if you think the main challenge now is um, Eliminating the false positives that uh, that space suggests, because I imagine it's quite a bumpy landscape. Um, or if it's more about synthesizing a promising target, um, <coughs> do you think the, the challenge is more in identifying a target or in the making it? Uh, so, target, you mean kind of small molecule yeah. in terms of, yeah, so I guess we can, there's different approaches we use. Um, you know, if, if you kind of want to sample an area of space, you can kind of do it multiple times to see actually are you in a local minute or the kind of maximum minima. And that's what essentially what we do. So, the molecules we identify. You know, I've gone through iterations and generations multiple times that you're not kind of sampling yeah, local space. So like I say, it's, it's a multi-dimensional topology and we want to make sure that we're in the right space. But then we also have you know, the ability to build machine learning models. So again, with our Heptaris uh, collaboration, they've got a vast amount of data on the target, which we could then apply and build a machine learning model to help identify the molecules that we'd selected, which were on multiple chemotypes because of the you know, multi-dimensional aspect of chemical space which ones we actually wanted to select. And actually we got a good enrichment. And then when that came through to synthesis, we had a 30% hit rate, which is you know, fantastic from a small set of compounds. So you know, it, kind of, it can work if you apply the right ways and you understand what the pitfalls are. And I think that's what we're quite good about with our team is we've, we've been there, done that. We understand what you need to do. And as long as you go in pragmatically, and understand the issues, it's fine. We're, we're kind of self-critical of ourselves on, on AI, you know, we will use it in the right place at the right time. Do you really need to use deep learning? Can you use a statistical mm -hmm. model? Actually, can you just use simple linear regression? You know, use the right tool in the right place. Um, so hopefully that's yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that was a question really to James, but Ravia, did you want to comment? Certainly on the last point, I know it was something we were talking about, you know, is, is AI always the solution? I appreciate that's what we're here to discuss, but maybe that's, that's a valid point. Is, I always, um, that's a, like a chemistry question that gets asked all the time, like is it chemistry synthesis that's the problem or identifying the compound. Um, I think there's incredible tools, um, as in our company, if we can run the experiment, we always do that above anything computational. That's just a principle that we have. And so I think fragment-based drug discovery is allowing us to sample chemical space without having to worry about the full synthesis route too much. And so um, there's a ton of computational chemistry, AI in, in chemistry, but the, the thing that I always wonder is like, this is great, but I'm going to have to run the experiment anyway, so why, do, why don't we just do this thing first and, and worry about the, the computational models later? But, but that's just a philosophy, it's not one or the other. So I have a question around partnerships. So uh, earlier you made this really nice comment saying, wouldn't it be nice if you as an AI company could have a roam around in pharma's chemical compound libraries and, and contribute with your algorithms and whatnot. Um, so just for a little bit of context, I'm a, a director at Antiverse and we have a AI driven antibody discovery platform. And we have got this nice validation with pharma companies already where we've shown that what we can do 
outruns whatever they have done in house and have successfully developed some antibodies for them. However, that's still not enough for them to actually get an, um, access to their underlying data sets, which for us, if we could get access to those, would be hugely valuable in training our algorithms. Um, but every time you kind of ask for it, they say, yeah, but we might do something with our data, even though you know perfectly well that they won't. Um, so how can you unlock the value there? And has anybody ever achieved that? Who would like to go first? Well, I can say something in terms of, you know, in terms of small molecules, I guess the enterprise, with metal the, the kind of EU enterprise to kind of big pharma kind of doing federated learning. So there is opportunities and ways of doing that. And actually, as a small company for us, we'd benefit a great deal by accessing that kind of data. We'd be able to, you know, maybe boost our models more than what big pharma have been able to do, which was kind of like a 1% average over all of the 10 farmers, 1% increase in their kind of predictive power. Whereas, yeah, the, the benefit then is, what's the benefit for them to allowing us access to that kind of data? Because we'll be then become equal competitors in that kind of regard. So no, we, we haven't kind of, yeah, we've got challenges in terms of that, in terms of, you know, how we could train models and, and access to data. But I just wanted to kind of say, it. and aside, there are ways of doing it, but, you know, it's a stepping stone in. I think that's validated an approach. And I think it needs to kind of go forward, you know, and, and we do more of that as a kind of industry. But I, I, I do think that like, the the partnership strategy needs to change, right? Like in pharma, these two to four million libraries that exist, people have been holding on to them, but like ChemSpace and Enemy now will allow you to way exceed that, right? And, and companies like yours. So I don't even know what the value of those 10 million or 20 million is any longer, right? So we default and we work with ChemSpace and Enemy. Um, so I think as there was actually a recent write up about this in Nature or somewhere, um, so I think over the next three, four years, there may be a shift in the pharma BD strategy to say, okay, we're not going to be that protective over our chemical space. Be because you can sidestep it now with, with the building blocks from ChemSpace and Enamine quite easily. Mm. Actually, a little bit of that kind of Melody program was that they also saw what the um, increase in their applicability domain was yeah. across the companies. And actually, some of them didn't have any increase. So it basically says that what pharma have got essentially, you know, they've got the same data sets, they've got the same type of compounds. So... You know, like I say, what is the point of when you've got Edomine that can generate up to 28 billion molecules because they've got, you know, they know the synthesis, they've got the building blocks, that far exceeds anything. You know, it's still a fraction of the chemical space, but it's better than anything else. So, yeah. And, and Pascal, you mentioned you've been, you've been setting up these collaborations. Is this, is this an issue that you're seeing? Have you come up with any solutions or are we still, unfortunately, struggling to deal with this one? I think from my experience, I can only comment on that. Uh, it's the, the data we use is very localized to a specific project, specific company to solve a specific problem. When that disappears, the data goes back to the company. It's, it's not us anymore. So we can't use it for anything. So as a CIO, that's what I'm seeing time and times again, is that the, the data comes in in a very, very specific way. And also there, for early drug discovery, at least the data set are very small compared to even probably biological data set. I mean, for chemistry, it's, it's tiny. So you need to, to work in a very clever way to overcome those obstacles of tiny data sets. But to answer your questions, yeah, we, we don't own the data set and they, we can't do anything with it. Yeah, I think the data is still perceived as very valuable, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So um, but whether that will shift in time. Are there any other points from the floor? Oh. So if we take the and then we'll press to you. So, I don't know if you've seen there's a gentleman a bit further back. There's a lady in green and then first. Thank you. Um, I wanted to kind of go back to your definitions and the importance of definitions. I'm not an AI person. I'm in the cell and gene therapy industry, but it was several years ago that we identified that everybody was speaking this common language, which wasn't a common language, um, and, and started to put together definitions. And I think, I think it went through the BIA, and I think it ended up as a British Standards booklet um, of definitions. I still don't think we're necessarily there, but I was just wondering whether instead of having your definition in your company and your definition in your company, maybe we should be looking in this area as a new industry um, at, at a common set of definitions. I'm happy to help if anyone does that. 
it w- would be nice from our point of view, actually, even from the, because from the patenting side, you, you can have two, two firms come at it and describe it in completely different terms. And it's an absolute nightmare from a searching point of view, because one of the things that, which AI is, is very useful at is, is obviously scanning over an enormous search space very quickly. But it's only as good as the search terms that you put in. And if people are using different terms, maybe quite deliberately, then you don't pick them up or, or, or whatever. Exactly. I think it comes a little bit to kind of standardisation that we've been talking about on even data. So even taking it a step further, you know, we want to have common language, but also we want a common standardisation across all data sets so that when people you know, do experiments, whether it's you, me or others, it can all feed in. So ultimately it's AI proofed across the board. So, you know, it needs to go there. And I think, I guess the, the UK has got its AI roadmap and part of that is about standardisation. So it's kind of on there, but it's on the radar. But I guess it probably can't come soon enough for what we're doing because we're generating such vast quantities if we're not actually you know, capturing it or labelling it correctly, it's all kind of wasted and we're generating, you know. Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, so it's Stuart Lowe from TTP. Um, it's great to hear that you're doing experiments and generating your own data. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of generating negative data as well as the hits? I'm guessing that was, a, that, that was directed at me. Um, when I raised the first round for the company, it was predicated on the fact that there was no negative data in the public domain and that you can't train pipelines without negative data. Um, the problem that we now have is that the way biology runs is you end up with a tremendous amount of negative data. And so now you've got these like very few ones and tons of zeros and the pipelines don't like that. So you're dealing with bias data sets and, and all of that. So I actually think in biology, like I, I keep coming back to this, I think the methods are well beyond what we can apply to the data sets that we have on hand, specifically at, at Ladder, but also in, in other places, because we can't generate standardized data well enough. It's heavily biased. It's not at the scale of like cat images for Google, and we're not getting there anytime soon. So we actually, as a company, think about how do we optimize computational methods for small data? And a lot of times that's just not deep learning because of, it doesn't make sense. So um, yes is the answer. Negative data is important. Was that, sorry, that we had a question down here as well, and there's one down there. I just wondered whether one was a, a follow-up to the, the comment that was just made. OK, it's a follow-up to the comment, and then we'll come back to you. Thank you. Behind you, sorry. Behind you. Yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah. James Hallman, uh, Cambridge Consultants. Following on from that, do we think, and again, I'm in the cell and gene space, do we think we're getting enough data? Are we interrogating our biology sufficiently well that we can build up those data sets? Or are we, uh, what I'm getting to is, do we need new sensing modalities, new ways of interrogating biology so that we can build up those data sets um, with sufficient detail on what is still a relatively limited number of samples? Um, I can take a punt, but then I think that the biology answer will be different from the chemistry answer, I think. Yeah. Well. Um, I actually think the competitive advantage moving forward is going to be proprietary data sets. And you've seen that with the Genentech recursion partnership, which is tremendous. It's a multi-billion dollar partnership. Um, and they've done that via terabytes of data sets. And um, do I think we have the modalities to do this properly right now in biology? Absolutely not. And actually, one of our biggest challenges is data versioning and tracking. Mm-hmm. So I have a pipeline. Every time we generate a new data set, we want to look at the metrics, right? Um, and ML ops and that entire area. And it, that for us is a much harder problem, actually, than building the machine learning tools. Um, so I don't think we have the tools. I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity there for all of like the thermo fishers of the world. Um, but every time I talk to people from the CRO world, they all know that moving things to a high throughput automated way is the future. As we think about building out our labs next year, we're not thinking about labs with, that are not automated. It just doesn't make sense for a long-term vision for the company. So, so no, I, I don't think the tools are there, but I think they'll get there soon. Would you like to comment from the chemical space, Pascal? Or? Okay. So I think for me, yeah, so I kind of agree. I think the, one of the problems is you do the experiment and then you look back and say, oh, we should have taken that measurement or we should have done this. 
it's really difficult to predict going forward what it is you actually need to measure it and then what you need to feed into the machine learning. But even then, the data that we do collect, from a chemistry point of view, it's, it really frustrates me that we say, yeah, we run a reaction at room temperature. Well, I can tell you, room temperature at December in Cardiff is very different to Hyderabad in the summer kind of room temperature. So even then, you know, you think it's simple, but it's not. So I think we need to kind of, yeah, rewrite the book on everything we do in this regard and really think going forward. You know what it is we need to measure and how but i guess the other thing is if you want to automate a process you need to really focus in on what it is you're measuring which then limits potentially the scope unless you can bolt things on so we may need to go through an automation kind of bottleneck to come out the other side in terms of a you know a richness of data maybe i'm not sure but yeah, it's interesting your comment about the, the room temperature because obviously the room temperature is varying in here. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Between <laughs> cold and baking, but um, anyway, uh, there was a question. Thank you, you've got your microphone, go uh, for it. Thank you. So my knowledge of AI is that the, the sum of these the last two talks, so forgive the naive question. But um, we talked a lot about the quality of the input data and then obviously you're going through a process of generating and learning information about the data, which in some respects is data itself. So to what extent can secondary data help you communicate the value of your tools to those who might need to or need to involve you in their job discovery? So as a scientist, how would I choose between your three companies? And perhaps the secondary data is exploring that as a way of helping me identify which is the best partner to partner with to, to get the answers I want. That's an interesting way of turning around the, the classic garbage in, garbage out um, and problem to, to, to focus on a more company. Um, do you want to start, Rabia? Or? I, can, I guess I can start. I, um, you know, it's, it's a fascinating space, small molecule targeting of RNA. And I'll tell you why I'm telling you this is because um, everyone's like, oh, you're a small molecule RNA targeting company, but no one goes around talking about small molecule protein targeting companies. We've moved past that. We're kinase companies. We're GPCR companies. Um, and, and so I always think about what's the problem you're trying to solve, what's the strategy, and then which company has the best tools. I mean, very, one is a CRO, one is a 3D chemistry company, we're a biology, small molecule RNA company. Um, and it, it comes down to the problem as opposed to the technology. I think the technology is absolutely irrelevant. It's about like if you're going after trinucleotide expansion, repeat disorders, probably best to partner with expansion, right? Because that's their core competency. If you're doing splicing, Skyhawk is doing that. So I actually think the technology is absolutely irrelevant. If you can prove that the technology is doing the thing you say that it's doing and it aligns with the strategic mission of the partner. So when we talk about our company, I, the technology platform, we don't talk about that. We talk about the case studies of how that's going to help us get a compound into clinic. I don't know if that answers your question. It's a big start for me, so thank you. <laughs> yeah. I think we are. We have three very different companies on the, on the panel quite, quite deliberately, so we're not really ne necessarily directly comparing you with each other, but perhaps with your other competitors in that in this space. Pascal, is there something around you know, being a CRO that, and, and choosing? I think the, the question is around how do you choose the best partner? You know, there's a lot of data about partners. So. I think I would answer the, the question very differently than, okay. than you because you would need to come to us with a kind of defined problem, something you want to solve. It can be just an idea you have and obviously some money to, to fund that idea. <laughs> 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 and then we would, uh, because of the, the size of the Charles River, we have experts in a huge variety of different fields, so we would assemble a a very detailed proposal and then uh, talk to you about how to execute your ideas but all come from the the ideas the problem you want to solve and then having this conversation going and i think you had something around uh, input data so you can either come with your own data but also we can for lack of input data run a large an hts and then start from there but that comes Everything comes from your ideas, as far as I'm concerned. So we've had two very different answers to the same question, although for me as a patent attorney, I'm loving the fact they're talking about the problem and solution approach. Would you like to um, throw in, is there a different, would you answer it differently or, or the same? I, I guess it's similar in terms of, you know, one, we, we kind of set expectations of like what it is you're bringing, what your problem is. So I think there's kind of overlap in terms of, you know, we're, we're very focused on solving the chemistry issue and maybe partners will come to us when they've exhausted other approaches. 
Um, so that means they've got some data, which is great for us to be able to build on them. We could kind of, you know, give them something new and novel, and that's where we've had, you know, successes. And then it comes down to case studies and actually proving that and saying, you know, this is what we can do in this area. So, but, you know, again, we're very pragmatic and open, you know, if, if we can't do something, you know, it's not in an error for whatever reason, because the data isn't there, then they'll say, well, it's higher risk. We can still do something, we can certainly can, but, you know, as a company where structurally enabled or ligand enabled and if you're missing one of those two pieces then you know the chances of success are kind of you know are enriched by having both data sets for sure um but yes you know just come speak to us if you've got problems and uh, you know we'll try and solve it with we like a challenge so we're into the last five minutes i think we've got time for one more comment question from the floor if are there any more hands tony <laughs> excellent you take precedent <laughs> And I'm just wondering, in a sense, from the experience, they've got different size companies and different models on the panel. Starting out, do you think companies should be looking to build capacity internally in using AI and data, or should they always look to outsource to a partner? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting question because we're thinking. Um, to kind of build the expertise in-house, but the, the, I think the huge advantage I see in partnering with someone is that they, small companies somehow maybe appreciate the more agile in kind of maybe a, a younger member of staff coming from university with fresh ideas and all that. So they can really implement like some new algorithm, new methodologies all, all the time and much more, can be much more dynamic in that respect. So I can see a value in both again, I think. And Just, again, so yes, and again, when one partnership doesn't work, then you can look into other companies as well, so. Sorry, I can just see the other group being mic'd up, but just quickly, did, did someone you wanted to, maybe, yeah, there's just behind you, it's coming. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Prashan O2H. Just one question. Um, Cambridge is a real hotbed for machine learning, AI, and particularly where these tools and ideas meet life sciences. How do we compare to other clusters in the world? Do we have a world lead or what are your views? That's where we're all looking at which. We, of course we do. Of course we do. I think, but we also have another panel who are AI experts and maybe they, they can pick, pick that up. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely see it. Although whether people are actually here, obviously following the pandemic is, um, or notionally here is is another matter, but yeah, I mean, I said we have got we've got the Samsungs, we've got the Googles, we've got the Microsofts of the world. They are here, mm -hmm. and that has then spawned the smaller companies. I'm not sure we're, we, I'm sure we're not unique, but we definitely have a good opportunity here in Cambridge. Um, it is an attractive place for people to come and be. It's not the only place that will attract people, but yeah. And certainly, we've got three great panelists who are not necessarily machine learning, but certainly bringing the other angle. So hopefully, that answers. And that's a really nice, positive thing to finish on. Um, so yes, I will um, thank our panelists for their, their great um, information and efforts today. And hopefully, you've enjoyed it all. And um, more, more to come with the next panel, which is touching on AI. Thank you. <laughs>